and welcome to Libertarian Counterpoint. With me today is Michael Graves, our new board member here in Libertarian from the Libertarian Party of Sacramento County, and our usual guest, John Cameron. How are you guys doing today? Very well. How are you doing today? Oh, yeah. Wonderful. I'm a bit disturbed today because Europe is attacking another Bitcoin, essentially self-hosted wallets of Bitcoin. Europe is going to essentially regulate them out of existence. Now, they can't regulate them out of existence, but what they are going to do is make it very difficult for the people to transact, have a transaction in them, because you, they need to have that know your customer laws. Mm. And if you have a self-hosted Bitcoin wallet, it's very difficult to for these um, institutions to know who your customers are, right? That's the whole point of, of Bitcoin, right. is to create some privacy. It's like cash. It's like you can't, you know, tracking cash is very difficult. And you don't want to, and so essentially that's what they're trying to do. It's not, so few people use, are using Bitcoin self-hosted wallets right now that it's not really an issue. So that's why they're trying to regulate it now to get it, to slip it in before any, anybody can have a chance to. My, my theory is it's going to backfire. And, and since they're trying to regulate them and it's going to be so difficult that everybody will figure that, well, if they're trying to regulate them, it must mean that they can't really track them. And that's where I want my money. So there's going to be an explosion of, of uh, people holding their own Bitcoin wallets. That would be my prediction. But, the, you know, the, the European government, just like any other government, they, they don't like people uh, hiding their money. And, uh, you know, it's just... <laughs> They don't like it because you can't. If you can't hide it, you can't regulate it. You can't tax it. You you can't uh, play favorites. And so uh, my prediction is going to go the other way. But uh, I think they're going to find it. And and if if they find a way to regulate that, then people will find some other way to to move money around in the in the uh, the universe of the internet without the ability to track. Yeah, they'll find some way. Yeah, I. I got to agree. I mean, I, this is not not a good thing for them to do. Um, you know, there's there's no need to do this. This isn't uh, the consumer is not benefited by by having you know this this option regulated uh, out of existence and having um, its benefits like sort of curtailed. But nonetheless, you know, uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are are a decentralized um, currency alternative. And um, they can't really stop people from using it. That's the beauty of it. Um, so it's, it's not going to go away, uh, but this is going to, to make it harder for, for the man on the street in, in those countries. And uh, that's, that's not a good thing. Yeah, and it's, it's the lack of privacy, essentially. It's another, it's another government, um, I'm, the word I'm trying to think, it's another government layer of lack of privacy, just another intrusion. intrusion. Thank yeah. you, John. It's another intrusion on our privacy where they're, they're putting this under the guise of, oh, we need to prevent fraud and, you know, prevent people from hiding their money or prevent fraud, fraudulent transactions and all that. But it doesn't do any good. Hmm. These, these uh, know your customer laws, they don't prevent the fraud in anywhere else. Hmm. It's very, they're very bad at actually catching fraud and this way, but yet they're going to do it because hmm. they like to control. I really think it's just they're, they have a... A need to control. And control I think fetish. And, and I'd like to just make one point. Yeah, Europe, and, and I don't really care that they regulate it, Europe led uh, the, the civilized world, the wrong way, the, the advanced world in, in putting regulations in place to protect people's internet privacy. So you, you can't track people. You have to, to give people a choice at the beginning of, of websites as to what other than functional cookies, what, what you could attach to them. And mm -hmm. so on the one hand, they've led the appearance of personal privacy. But in this hand, they're taking away personal privacy. So I think the first one was politically motivated. And the second one is they want your money. Yeah, well... Well, let's think about it. Is they're protecting our privacy from marketers to trying to sell us a bunch of junk, mm. but they're not protecting our privacy from the government who can actually ruin our lives and destroy our lives and mm. put us in a cage. Mm. You know, so I think one of these things is actually more important than the other. Mm. One of these privacies is more important than the other, but we focus on the wrong ones. Mm. Yes, we do. Yeah, because I've never seen a Target send an armed patrol over to Walmart to take customers, but but the government will do whatever it wants to get you. 
Yeah. And I just fill in any government name. It doesn't have yeah, to it doesn't, be French, EU, United German, States, it doesn't matter. Ugandan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. it's just the, the limit, you know, the benefits to the users of the cryptocurrencies are, it's very limited. You know, the, the whole purpose is that it's decentralized and you can't track it and no one person controls it. And um, so if you're using cryptocurrency, presumably the reason you're using it is because you want those benefits. And with that comes um, risks. That's just personal responsibility. But there's there's no benefit in general to, um, to imposing these kind of regulations and trying to, you know, make the crypto space trackable. Um, that's the whole purpose is that the people using it don't want to be tracked. And they're just going to drive it underground. There's gonna, you're going to create black markets. This is what happens when you, you make voluntary activity illegal. Yeah, and essentially they're going to get everybody back to cash, which they're trying to get people off of. Because mm. if you can't go to crypto, you're going to go back to cash. Well, what's just sort of funny about it is, um, you know, the, the country that's been way ahead of the curve, ahead of the curve in this regard, uh, in you know trying to ban cryptocurrencies and regulate it out of existence is China, but um, it hasn't gone away in China. China's still a major crypto hotspot, in fact, and that's that's what's going to happen in Europe. They'll drive it underground. The, you know they're going to make it harder to use, and we you know we oppose this. We don't think this is a good thing, but it's it's not going to go away, um, and they can't really stop it. But what they will do is make it so that you can't tell people that you're doing it, and this is it's silly. Well, yeah. I don't tell people anything I'm doing now. So, yeah. <laughs> well, Except we'll talk, on this show. Yeah, and we'll half of about, what I say is made up anyway. <laughs> IRS. Oh, well, <laughs> but so talk about regulations gone wrong. Um, Extinction Rebellion, which is <laughs> essentially... <laughs> oh, we've got John started over here. You've got John ready for a rant. I'm before. getting all... Let me loosen my tie <laughs> so I can really go after this. Extinction Rebellion, they essentially want to get rid of capitalism because they believe, you know, free markets and capitalism create economic, uh, I mean, ev environmental devastation. <laughs> That's essentially what their argument is. And, but <clears throat> the studies have now shown, and it's really not even close, that the more free market your, your society is, the cleaner your environment becomes. Mm -hmm. And the more controlled, centrally controlled your environment is, the, your c economy, your country is, the less environmentally friendly it is. Mm -hmm. And this is not even, it's not even close. It's mm -hmm. actually, it's astounding. But yet, we still continue to push for the centralized control of environmental policy. I, I have something to say about this. Yeah. I know you're I'm, shocked. We're shocked, John. We're um, all shocked. So the, the whole premise behind the, the Green Movement, really, if you look underneath it, it's been socialism. It's been socialism from the start. Uh, the UN and all its green initiatives, if you look at the UN, all the people that uh, are, are representative of the various countries there are, are push socialist, centralized government, government control, government control, government control. And environmentalism has been uh, a great way uh, for them to say, well, you know, in the environment and, and, and global warming and climate change is so important that we can't let things like property rights and democracy and and private property and commerce and everything get in the way because we must save the planet. But it turns out that they've been wrong from the start, as we all knew. Um, and you, you look at all the studies that indicate that the countries that take the best care of their environment are countries where uh, uh, basically capitalism is the least fettered and property rights are greatly enforced and people are wealthy because when you're wealthy you're not willing to go uh, kill a uh, rhinoceros and cut its horn off so you can feed your starving family for two years from the money you make as a poacher. Um, if you have lots of money you can buy 10,000 acres and put these rhinoceros on it and charge people an admission to go. And uh, it's always going to be this way, and, and it's the, the, the problem of the commons. Uh, if, it's, if everybody owns it, nobody owns it. I, I would like to see every single piece of the United States of America owned by private individuals, every single bit of it. And um, you're, you're darn straight that they would take care of it. Now, yes, there might be, there, I don't think there's going to be condos on the top of Half Dome, but... Uh, under that guise. I mean, you look at some of the crazy <laughs> things that, that environmentalists are doing in the name of saving the environment. There's one wind farm in the Altamont Pass in um, 
here in California, for all of our international viewers, California, that has killed 1,000 golden eagles. That's one wind farm. And, and if you look at the, the, the imprint of, you know, all these forced economic decisions like favoring, not, not letting the markets decide what people are going to do, but letting some government bureaucrat who's stealing money and handing it over to their friends, which is what they all do, no matter what party it is, except for the Libertarian Party folks, um, is going to go on. So privatize it all and take care of the little critters. Uh, and and they will be better taken care of. The air will be cleaner, um, just as it has been throughout the world up to this time and going forward. You let some bureaucrat be in charge of it, and we're going to have the kind of the kind of ecological disaster w that was the Soviet Union. I mean, they killed off one of the one of the uh, prettiest lakes in the world, drained it completely to to try to grow wheat in an area where wheat wouldn't grow. So anyway. Yeah, yeah, I, I got to agree. Um, you know, I, I want to acknowledge the environmentalists. You know, I'm, I myself, you know, consider myself a bit of an environmentalist. Um, uh, these are real problems, you know, the, how should humans um, coexist with the environment? You know, we have to impact the environment to, to survive. You know, that's, that's been true kind of forever. But, um, you know, there, there are better and worse ways to do it. You know, you don't throw trash in the river. You don't, there's, you know, there's do's and don'ts. And there's, there's better and worse, you know, more sustainable ways to do things. Um, but in general, yeah, a, a, you know, this is perfectly compatible with a private property system. And, um, you know, it, it already works. You know, you compare um, the eastern United States where, you know, most of the land is privately owned and private property encourages stewardship of the natural resources because you you own it so you know you, you don't want it to you know be polluted or destroyed right these are the things that happen when people are you know uh, able to impose uh, you know pollution and costs on sort of public resources uh, and you know in the western united states a lot of you know it's like a lot a lot a lot of the land is owned by the state and federal governments um, and, you know, what you get is like the horrific wildfires that we've had in California. You don't have wise stewardship of the natural resources. And as you say, you know, what could you expect? Because nobody owns it. It's some bureaucrat making the decisions. So, yeah, there's a, yeah. There's a better way. Yeah. And I, I don't know anybody who doesn't want to figure out a way to live cleaner. And so what, what really bothers me is we have a lot of these, these people today saying we've done nothing to environment. We've done nothing. But I remember as a child walking to school, being able to see the air on a regular basis. Mm. And today it's a rare day where I can mm. see the air, despite the fact that the city well, I've yeah, grown up. Yeah, but you up, got bad. No. Yeah, but, but despite the fact that the city has exploded in size. Yeah. And so we have more cars, more people, more traffic, and yet cleaner air. So we've clearly done something. Mm. So we clearly haven't done nothing. We've clearly made progress. Mm. We've clearly made advancements. And so... This notion that we've done, it just really irritates mm. me because it, it's, it's ignoring the, the progress that a lot of people have spent a lot of time, money, and effort in making. And, you know, yes, we want to fig figure out how to live cleaner in the future, but let's not forget how far we've actually come. Mm. And then the, you brought up the word cleaner. Um, give you an example about, uh, you know, tr trying to go to electric uh, cars, for example, talking about how clean they are and green they are and all the rest of that. Volvo actually uh, ran a study on one of their SUVs and, and included all costs that had a carbon footprint. And we, I won't talk about carbon on the show because anyway. Um, <laughs> so, um, and it turns out that their little SUV, and this is a little Volvo SUV, this is not a big Tesla S. I, I, I imagine the numbers on Tesla S are like five times worse. You have to drive the thing for 94,000 kilometers before you're at break even, right? Mm -hmm. Before you're, you're even at the same footprint as driving a gas vehicle because of the batteries and the transportation and the extraction and the manufacturing and all the rest of that. I'm willing to bet if you, if you ran the same number against a Tesla, which I lust after, by the way. I want one of those things. <laughs> uh, but I'm just, my last name's Cameron. I'm not going to spend the money. It's probably 200,000 miles before you're at, at, at break even. And then you're forcing people into an inefficient, um, an inefficient technology because you drive the thing for 400 miles and unless you get somewhere 
or 350 where they have a fast charging station, you have to park it for eight hours to charge the battery. So not everybody's going to do that. There is a very simple solution, but I'm not going to mention it on the air because I'm thinking about patenting it. But no. anyway, well, no, my ahead. simple solution is the, the new Honda hydrogen vehicles. Those things are actually quite – those. that's the future, if you actually – Oh, yeah, it's the future. Honda and still has, it, has finally got it figured out, and but we're going off to batteries. Batteries well, I, are I, terrible. I, yeah. They're always dying and going – batteries are awful. And, and batteries <laughs> are filthy. I mean, you look at what a battery does when you extract all the nasty stuff you need to make a battery and the battery is dead and you throw it away. You got to unextract all that stuff. What's that cost? You're back at a zero sum. And I agree, absolutely. But now, finally, our government is starting to talk about nuclear power because the French have been able to do nuclear power without any waste forever. Why? Because they reprocess waste and 92% of that unused thing gets reprocessed over and over and over again. And if you had the unlimited power that we'd have through nice, clean nuclear plants, you can produce yeah. all the hydrogen you want. Yeah. All yeah. it needs is power. You just need power and water. And I agree with you. Hydrogen's the way to go. Yes. Yeah. I, I want to say that, um, yeah, when it comes to electric vehicles and the, the hydrogen-powered ones, which really is just a, it's a very nice energy storage technology, so it's kind of a, it's like a chemical battery. Um, you know, I, I just think you let... Uh, the market decide, mm. you know, you, um, which really means consumers, which means individuals. Um, you know, people people can figure it out. You know, if the battery technology gets a lot better and the, the prices come down, maybe it really is better. You know, mm. I, I wouldn't say it is right now in general, but, you know, for some people, maybe, mm. maybe it is. You know, people can figure it out. And, um, you know, your point's well taken. Like, basically, um, you know, a lot of these environmental costs are baked into the capitalist price system, right? So if the battery technology is is priced at a point where it's well this costs you know a lot more you got to you know save on a lot a lot a lot of gas to recoup mm. you know the more expensive battery costs well what is that mm. that is manufacturing costs and a lot of those are energy costs you know trucking around all these parts and mm. um so you know if that thing's more expensive that that's one of the things that's telling you is you're not really um you know doing so much good on that yeah not only rich people you know, the, the, this is, if this is so clean and wonderful and everything, the only people that can afford electric vehicles are rich people. And the people that buy them are rich people. And yes, one sir. of the reasons yeah. they can do it is because they need the tax break. And the government has designed a tax break into uh, electric vehicles to favor rich people buying them and, and basically punished any other source of vehicles. So we could talk about this for days on end. Just days on end, and it. well, it all boils down to trust in your government, right? If you're, gonna have, <laughs> if, you're gonna, if you're gonna have this kind of policies, you're gonna have to trust your government to make proper decisions, right? But as we can find out, we don't, cannot trust the government to make proper decisions. Right. I think just don't regulate these industries, you know, don't, you know, no subsidies for anyone, no tax break, you know, just uh, well, give tax break to everyone, that'd be good. Yeah. But, um, but no no favoritism and, and people figure it out. There's, there's no need to, you know, play favorites with the technology. Yeah. And yeah, in Detroit, so in Detroit, we've got we've got just a couple minutes, but in Detroit, the uh, government in Detroit has not repaid back something like six hundred million dollars in extra tax property taxes they have taken from their student from their uh, community members. Six hundred million dollars, and they say it's against the law for them to, to refund it. Huh. huh. Somehow so, they're kind of clear claiming it's against the law to ooh. properly refund. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, that's, the, the that's a classic of, example oh. of the problem that recurs with government, which is the government decides what the, the law is. So even if they really, you know, owe you the money, you know, and any reasonable person can see that, well, they're just going to interpret it to say that it's what they like. Um, so, you know, the problem is it's this one-way power dynamic where you're compelled to pay the taxes and you don't have any, you know, say. I mean, we have this kind of democratic structure, but... It's often it's not terribly effective, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And we um, have, yeah, we're just about out of time, but we wanted to make sure that uh, we want to thank, um, what, what is that? No, nope, maybe we're not out of time. Can you read that sign for me? Yes, John? I can. Four. <laughs> Four minutes. Is that correct? <laughs> all, right. all right. We're running on, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, all the tens of thousands of viewers out there, especially those orbiting the, the, no. the earth right now. We're, we're operating on a skeleton crew, and so I apologize. We're a skeleton crew and a blind host. So, you know, well, between, no, the, between no, the two of those. Not completely blind. Not completely blind. Hey, I'm less blind than I was a couple now weeks what, ago. That, that, that article that you, that you just mentioned, the thing that you just mentioned, supposedly 100,000, I got to check the numbers at a different source, 100,000 people lost their homes. But yes. the, the one source of the story that I could find was a very, very radical left-leaning publication, so I really want to check their numbers. But um, 
you know, if, if the government steals from you, uh, then, then they can unsteal from you. It's, it's that easy. Oh, yeah. what, the, what, uh, what they taketh, they can give back. Yeah, they deliberately overassessed houses yeah. and, you know, overcharged people. And many people lost their house because they couldn't, yeah. because yeah, sure. they couldn't afford yeah. the tax bill. No. And they were, so yeah. they were foreclosed on. Yeah, and, you know, I agree. And um, property tax is, is one of the most, it might be the most objectionable single category of tax to me because um, you're basically saying, okay, you, you already made your money and you paid your income tax and you did all this stuff and then you bought something that you think is yours, but you got to pay tax on it to keep it. So you're really kind of saying that it's not yours, even though you own it, you still got to pay, you know, basically mm -hmm. a little rent on it. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. It doesn't... It's just wrong that would to be me. protection money, basically. Yeah, if anybody exactly. else did it, is yeah, we'll let your store be yeah. open. and you but don't if even you don't you know, pay this fee. We're going to burn it down. The idea is that okay, yeah. we got you know you've got some money because you got you got this you know property that you own. You know that's probably just your house. You know, but um, and so we're we're going to tax these guys, but this falls on on rent payers too, right? Just people who are just it falls on everyone because um, if you're renting from a property owner, a landlord, mm -hmm. that tax is going to get baked into your rent and it's going to get passed on to you. So this is, it's just, uh, it hits everyone and it's, it's not a good way to do it. Well, and we talk about, you know, the, the ever increasing cost of living that we're, we're all facing. And well, this is all part of it. Those yes, taxes sir. are baked into the cost of Absolutely. living. Absolutely. Yeah. And so how can these, we complain that, well, well, our cost of livings are so high, our rent is too high. Well, then stop making things, doing passing policies and having that make the rent so damn high in the first place. Can fix that though. They, they, by charging builders lots of money to, as a fee so that they can build affordable housing, I'm sure that's going to fix everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You charge $90,000 <laughs> fee to build a house, and so your house is now $100,000 more expensive mm. just off the top. That's just here in Sacramento. Mm. Just off the top of your brand new house in Sacramento is $100,000 more expensive just in a fee. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Well, you also, that also prevents them from building. Mm. We're seeing that. But the government is going to fix the problems that, oh, wait, the government created. I'll believe that when I see it. <laughs> well, talk about more government problems. Cato and their Freedom of Information Act requests have exposed <sighs> some serious, um, shall we say, oh, what's the word I want Improprieties? to use? Improprieties? Uh -oh. That's a good word. Immoral, illegal, disgusting acts. Would uh, criminal acts. Criminal. Let's say, criminal. In, uh, say criminal. Inside the FBI. And it's not like we're known. Oh, we've, we've seen this for a long time. In, you know, I've ceased things. to be surprised when I hear about things like this. <laughs> the FBI. No, I'm, I'm actually, um, <clears throat> I was, well, it, a, a very good attorney to me said, because I told him I don't believe that the, the government, people that work in government are smart enough to have conspiracies. And he said, well, not before the fact, John, you're absolutely right. But he said, how many FOIA requests, which is FOIA, Freedom of Information Act uh, requests, are, are fully replied to? In other words, when you tell the government by force of law that they need to let you look at records, how many times do, they th do you think they actually let you look at all the records? And my answer would be never. So if we're yeah, seeing, if we're yeah. seeing 700 examples that the that the FBI found of itself yeah. uh, 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 basically breaking the law then that means there's probably 70,000 because this is a self-analysis and this is just in one year but it's just crazy yeah and what's what's really awful about it is you know when you're when you work for one of these government agencies you know how many of these people do you think are really going to you know, suffer consequences for doing this. Uh, you know, maybe some, but in none, general, you none know. None so far. If Yeah, none so far, <laughs> exactly. And, you know, if you or I did that, you know, they throw the book at you. And so it's just, there's, it's like a different category mm. of treatment. And so it's just, it's not mm. right. It's it's like the Star Chamber. We, we, we talk about civilization advancing. Uh, people that, that were in favor of the king operated under different laws. Yes, yes. And now yeah. they still do, but it's called qualified immunity. These people go unpunished. I mean, the FBI agency right. agent that basically made up the stuff about Trump, um, the, the lawyer that lied, um, I think had to do two weeks community service, and now he's fully reinstated in the bar of yeah, the state exactly. where he got his yeah. license. And this is an attempt by, by people to take down a standing president. And if you or I did that, we'd, we'd be in prison. 
So what yeah. the heck? And in this particular case, they had um, agents essentially going rogue, starting investigations without approval from their supervisors. Mm. You know, just starting investigating people. Just no, because. it's not an investigation. It's an assessment. An, ass an assessment. assessment. Yeah. An assessment is something that doesn't is made up out of whole cloth. Everybody needs to read the, this Cato thing. Made up of whole cloth, where they can just decide to start doing investigations on people who've never even been accused of a crime just because they want to. It because it's not an investigation. It's an assessment. And they can use uh, FISA information, they can tap phones, they can do internet searches, they can do whatever they want. It's disgusting, folks, and you need to check it out. Yeah, and I'm gonna connect this conversation to the, um, the Black Lives Matter protests of 2020 because um, you know, what were those protests protesting is the same kind of problem. You mentioned qualified immunity. It's, you know, the issue is that, okay, when police are clearly doing something wrong, they don't get treated the same way that you or I would if we did that. You know, they're, you know, they're, they're not going to mostly be punished. They, and as you say, they're reasonably likely to be back on the job well, next and year. Their punishment is getting fired. And that's... Mm. And our punishment would be spending would 10 be years in a jail. cage. Oh, yeah. 10, 10 would be minimum. Uh, yeah. And getting that's, fired, getting fired... Yeah, if you, it, if they you, might get yeah. fired. If, might. if you get fired from one police department and go to work for another one, and a lot of times they get a severance package, they get to keep their pension, and uh, and and nothing happens to them. Yeah, you have to crazy. go after it, them in civil court. It's crazy. And you've got the the FBI that's got even even more. That was two minutes. And so this is the trouble with with government agents of the government. They get treated differently and. Of course, you're going to see bad behavior with a system like that. Mm. And so, yeah, you know, I think abolish it all, return to a private property society. But, um, you know, short of that, uh, getting rid of these kind of qualified immunity treatment and just mm -hmm. saying, look, it's not one rule for you and one rule for me. Everybody has to operate by the same rules and you're, you're still liable just because you work for the FBI or the police. You know, sorry. Um, same law. Yeah, the whole point of the United States. That would be a good place I to disagree. start. I disagree. I think I think anybody in elected public office should be held to a higher standard <laughs> yeah, than well, me. Uh, if not, you are an agent of the, the government, same. should you not be held not, to a higher not standard? Not the same standard, a higher standard. Right? Should you and not? Certainly not, not a lower if, standard. Yeah. <laughs> not, not a lower standard. Not even the same standard. A higher standard. If you're unwilling to do that, uh, then I th I don't think you should have the job. And I think any time a politician promises that a program is going to do something. If it doesn't, he has to repay all the money out of his own pocket. That's my new idea. How about that? All right. All right. And we are about out of time, I believe. Hmm. Is that what that sign says there for me, Well, it says it's pretty close. I mean, <laughs> uh, if, if one minute is about out of time, then I the think one minute is about out of time. I want to thank you guys for coming here. We want to thank Access Sacramento for being here. We want to remind everybody that uh, their big day of giving is coming up on May 5th. So I believe... Big dog. Big dog. Yeah, big can, day of giving. We, you can uh, participate in that. We all would appreciate that. They have supported us during these last two years, so let's make sure we support them. Mm -hmm. one John, mm. Michael, thank you for being here. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks and for having me. I and appreciate it. Love everybody. Yeah. Love them by leaving them alone. How about that? There we go. Yeah. Because eventually you got to let go of the baby's hand. You'll never learn how to walk.